people. It's good to be back with you. We are in the book of 1 Thessalonians. So I want you to keep your, you need to have two fingers today. One's going to be in Matthew chapter 3 and the next one's going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. So if you've been with us on our journey through the book of Thessalonians, we go verse by verse uh, through the Bible. We believe it's the best way to learn the Bible. And also that means we can't skip over stuff. We can't say, well, I don't want to talk about this difficult issue. No, we want to go through and talk about everything that we find in our Bibles. Uh, the title of the message this morning is Your Faith Matters to Me. The Bible has a lot to say about faith. Actually, over 380 times the Bible mentions faith. Jesus also had a lot to say about faith. Actually, there is two times in the scriptures where Jesus says, you have great faith. Uh, in one instance was Jesus uh, came in contact with a centurion, and this centurion, his, uh, one of his soldiers were, were ill, and the centurion said, hey, my, my, my servant's ill, and Jesus says, well, let's go. The centurion said, da, 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 da. hey, just give the word. Jesus said, hey, what great faith you have. So the centurion's servant was healed. And then another occasion in uh, Matthew chapter 15, there was a Canaanite woman, uh, her daughter really needed Jesus, and she was following Jesus, uh, crying out to Jesus, and Jesus' disciples were going, hey, send her away. But she kept coming, and Jesus said, hey, I've come to the lost sheep of Israel. Um, I can't give uh, uh, bread to, to dogs. I just can't do that. And she says, but even, even the, the, the dogs eat the crumbs off of the table. And Jesus says, woman, great is your faith. Oh, why is faith so important, family? Well, faith is, is the foundation we stand on in Jesus. Uh, think about this, and many of you will know this is true. When our enemy comes for us, he comes for our faith. When times get difficult in your life, what's the first thing that gets hit? It's your faith. The enemy knows that if he can disrupt our connection, that if he can somehow uh, cause us to no longer trust and doubt, we're going to pull back from church. We're not going to read our Bibles. We may even say things like, well, you know what? Maybe this whole Jesus thing was kind of made up and maybe it was just my feelings and emotions all wrapped up. Family, Jesus places a great importance on faith. Your faith means everything. And, and it's important to protect and to keep your faith. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter, chapter 3 for just a couple of minutes as we talk about the importance of faith. Now, this is on the, the heels of uh, Jesus being, being baptized. And Jesus, after he is baptized, it says this in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. It's always good to hear Bible pages turning. When you get there, give us an amen. amen. Matthew chapter 3, as we're talking about, not only is faith important, but our enemy comes for our faith. Matthew chapter 3, Jesus has uh, just been baptized, and it says this in verse 17 of Matthew chapter 3. It says, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying what? And whom I'm well pleased. Good job, guys. So now listen to this. Go down to chapter four. So Jesus is now in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. Listen to how the devil works in verse three. It says, now when the tempter came to Jesus, he said, what? Yeah. If, push pause, wait a minute. We just heard from God the Father that said to Jesus, to, to everyone there that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And what does the enemy attack first? Jesus. If you are who your father said you are, let's keep on reading to uh, verse, uh, verse uh, three, and, or verse three, listen to verse six. In verse five, it says, then the devil took Jesus up to, uh, into the holy city and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Listen to verse six. And said to him, what? If you are the son of God. That's all for this morning right there. So, so we clearly see God the Father declaring that Jesus is his son. 
And when Jesus is tempted and tested, the first thing that's attacked is his faith. Does, is, is God, are you who God says you are? This is my beloved son. And then Satan says, well, if you are the son of God, not once, but twice. Uh, family, our, our enemy comes for, for our faith. Ask yourself this. How many doubts about Jesus are rolling around in your head right now? Maybe there's, there's a couple. Ask yourself why. We, we, we almost take life. It, how do you say it? I was, was uh, on an airplane uh, coming from Colorado, and uh, we were on the runway, and uh, the captain says, well, the, the, the maintenance team, uh, they need to bring a few bolts for, for the plane. <laughs> I'm thinking, you take your time with that, right? So we were on the runway for like an hour, and they said, well, if anybody wants to get off the plane, so I'm like, yeah, this, we're about to go, something's going to about to happen right now. So I said, hey, see if there's another plane available. So we're still waiting on the, on the runway and he comes again, if you want to, you know, if you want to get off the plane, you can get the plane. But he didn't save for any money at all. So I'm like, well, I guess, you know, I'll, I'll sit on the plane. <laughs> then the captain, the captain said is, um, they need to remove a few panels. <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> Do I stay? Do I leave? Is this like that sign that I'm waiting for? <laughs> the plane was full. Only one person left. And I'm thinking, okay, so we have a bunch of strangers removing panels from a plane. The plane is already missing some screws. <laughs> Nobody left. We're all sitting down in the plane like it's no, we're going to be 30,000 feet in the air. No one cares. But then it comes to Jesus. Well, I don't know if I can believe that. When a complete stranger is removing panels from a plane, nobody said, do they know what they're doing? Have they done this before? Because we're about to get in the air. But when it comes to Jesus, all of a sudden, for some, all of these questions exist, but yet you're willing to go 30,000 feet in the air with a complete stranger as other strangers are using their power tools to remove panels from a plane. I feel excited right now. <laughs> Jesus, help me. So family, it's important to know our enemies coming for your faith. If he can discourage you through suffering, through trials, through life, he's going to do it over and over again. But my hopes are that you and I will stand fast that you and I would stand fast. Uh, here in our text, the Apostle Paul is going to write uh, to the church in Thessalonica. Like Pastor Jim two weeks ago uh, began uh, talking about this. And, and, and Paul says in chapter three, verse one, it says, when we could no longer endure it, he says this, we thought it'd be good to be left in Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, it says to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. It says in verse three that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we, we are appointed to this. In fact, we told you when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it has happened. And you know, it says for this reason, when we could no longer endure it, we... We sent to know of your faith. It says, lest by any means the, the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. We want to know how your faith is doing. You're, you're going through trials and testings and afflictions. We want to make sure the tempter has not tempted you. Because what tends to happen sometimes, family, when we're going through suffering, instead of plugging into Jesus, instead of digging in, sometimes uh, we pull back. And then the enemy says, well, if, if your God is so powerful and mighty, why are, you, why are you suffering? Where's God? You know, you've lost your job and you've lost this. Where, 
Where is God? And some of you go, mm, yeah, where, where is he? Just maybe, family, nothing's wrong at all. What, what, is the, what, is the, what does the Bible say? We, you know that we are appointed to this. I want to let you know, Beaumont's not heaven. <laughs> Banning's not heaven. Cherry Valley's not heaven. Amen. But when we get to the kingdom, we're not, there's not going to be any suffering. But here we are appointed. But, but suffering is never wasted. Uh, many of you love the Psalms and, and David says, the Lord is my strength. The Lord is my shield. The Lord is my stronghold. The Lord is my portion forever. How did David know the Lord was his strength? He had to go through a little something, something. How did David know the Lord was enough? He had to experience not having enough to look to Jesus. So whatever you're going through, family, the Lord is. Some of you has got you in the, is the oven nice and hot. Yeah, yeah. Got you in there and he's not going, is it ready yet? No, it's in there. He's walked away. <laughs> then he's going to come back when, when, when you and I are ready. Paul is letting, letting the church know, I'm concerned about your faith. And this is where we pick up our text. When you get to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, give me an amen. amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We are going to look at verses 6 through 13, Lord willing. And it says, it says this. It says, but now Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love that you always have a good remembrance of us greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Listen to verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God? Listen to this. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you what? Increase and what? And abound in love towards who? One another. It says, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And the church said, amen. amen. Hey, if you're taking some notes this morning, our first point we're going to learn about is a faith and love must be cultivated and protected. How many of you have fruit trees? God like, oh, dang. Wow, a bunch of farmers in here. All right. So, so one of my friends, I went over to his house and he's got foil hanging off of his trees. There's a scarecrow in the back. We're talking about amendments and soil and, 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 and trees uh, blossoming. And hey, take a bite of this. Uh, what is he doing? He is protecting the fruit. He's, he's protecting, he's, he, he's cultivating the ground to, to, to make sure when he puts the tree in there that it has, a, it has a, the best, um, the best uh, possibilities of, of growing. If we were to go to Cherry Valley Nursery here and say, hey, I want to I plant a, a fruit tree or, or a flower, and I just want to make sure that uh, it can grow to its capacity. Uh, what do I need to do? They're going to say, well, just uh, get a shovel, dig a hole, and put a plant in there and cover it up and water it. No, no, no. They're going to say, hey, you need some amendment. You got you to mix it up. You got to mix it up a little bit. And then you got to watch out for the birds. So they're going to tell you, you need to protect the fruit, throw up a scarecrow or something like that to, to, to keep what you want to blossom. Family, our faith should be on a greater level. That faith and love must be cultivated and it must be protected. I ask you this. We protect things like our car. Right now, I'm quite certain 99% of your cars are, are locked. You're like, did I lock the car? <laughs> yeah. Lock. Because you care about your car. Everyone has passwords on your, on your computers, on your, your, your ATM card, has a, has a code. We protect all of these type of things. But do you protect your faith? Do you cultivate your faith? 
Be careful, family, that everything in your life is protected. There's a lock on your house. There's a lock on this, a passcode for this, a face recognition for this. But yet your faith is wide open. And then when the enemy comes in and says, oh, there's, there's no one standing guard. Whew, let me just take everything. Let me just discourage them. But family, this is how we, we cultivate and protect faith. We, we keep our, our, our face in here. We, we not only read it, but we, but we, do, we do what it says. Uh, so Paul is saying, hey, Timothy has come back and he's brought us some good news of your faith, of your faith and your love. That Timothy got back and said, man, those guys are doing great. The, the afflictions and the trials, they, uh, they haven't had an effect on them. They're, they're going through a difficult time, but, but they're plugged in. Now, many of us know people that started off really, really great following Jesus. I mean, we would call it on fire for the Lord. I mean, you're, you're, you're in your word, you're at church, you're, you're telling other people about Jesus, you're on Facebook with your, you know, uh, posting some scriptures, things are going really, really well. Uh, then uh, my wife and I have been praying for, uh, for someone and uh, they started off really, really good. But then the enemy came for their faith. And now it's kind of like the individual's like, well, I don't know anymore. So how do we go from on fire, loving, trusting, serving, worshiping to, I don't even know anymore. Faith was not protected and not cultivated because our enemy wants to come and take that which matters most. And if he can give us to, if he can get us to, to doubt, if he can uh, allow, if, you know, if, if, if affliction continues to, to be in our lives, sometimes our natural tendency is, Father, where are you? Jesus, what are you doing? This hurts. I read about your greatness. I just don't see it right now. Be careful, family. There's nothing wrong with saying, Lord, I, I, I'm, Lord I'm, 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 I'm here, but I need you to, to help me. So he'll, he'll, bring us, he'll bring us here so I guess it's like this. Let's be resolved to follow Jesus regardless, right? That Jesus, regardless, I'm going to follow you. Whatever you give, whatever you take, I'm not going to follow you conditionally. You know, what did Job say? He says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. He didn't say, well, I just, the Lord took everything. There's a wonderful hymn, uh, Horatio uh, Spafford, what? Is it how, how great, uh, uh, how great, how, how great they are. Just, and what a, if you go and read the, the backstory, um, uh, there, there was a, I believe there was a, there was an accident and, uh, he lost, uh, I believe the majority of his family. And, and then he, and then he, uh, he, he, he pinned, uh, he pinned how great they are. You're like, what? Someone came for his faith and he, he guarded his faith, his faith in God, you and I must make sure we're guarding our faith and that we are, we're cultivating and, and protecting this thing called, called love and, and called hope. And, and Timothy comes back and he says, hey, the church is doing good. Uh, they're, they're going through it, but they are still loving one another. Uh, they, they, they've, they've not uh, uh, ceased to, uh, to follow Jesus, although trials and, and hardships they're enduring. They're still following Jesus. I want to encourage you with this, family, that trials and suffering would be the gasoline to our faith. That trials and sufferings would be the gasoline to our faith. That, that you and I would be so resolved to say, no matter what I'm going to go through in this thing called life, it's just me and Jesus. That's it. So tribulations, they're going to come. Uh, difficult times are going to come. But Jesus, I'm not going to follow you conditionally. Jesus is, ju is just you and me. Can you imagine Jesus loving you and I conditionally? Can you imagine Jesus is saying, if you mess up one, one, one more time, if you pray about this, that, that same struggle one more time, I'm done. I think none of us would be here. No way, Maz, for that, huh? Jesus, uh, help us. 
to, to guard and to, and, and to cultivate. And, and that's, what you're, that's what we're doing this morning. We're, we're cultivating our faith. We're, we're hearing about the word of God and the greatness of God. In the face of what we're, what we're all uh, going through, we're hearing the inerrant word of God. We're, we're cultivating right now. So you don't see it, but the spirit of God is just <laughs> doing this. He's like, they don't need that. They don't need that. They don't need that, but they need this. And then he's just, because we're, we're here, we're here in, in the word. And, and Paul goes on and he says in verse six, that you always have a good remembrance of us. It says, greatly desiring to see us. What if church is to be like this? Rhetorical question. Paul is so concerned about their faith. He didn't say, well, I'm just going to pray about it. No, Timothy, you got to go see them. We love them so much. We, go see how their faith is doing. They bring a, they bring a, a report back. And then Paul is saying, we, you remember us and we're greatly desiring to see you. What a beautiful church Thessalonica had to be that they cared so deeply for one another. And again, they didn't have FaceTime. They, they either had to walk or, 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 or take a, a ship. So when you went to see somebody, you went to see somebody. That when they saw you, they knew that you had to walk. It, it took great lengths to see them. And how great, Paul is saying, you have a good remembrance of us and you're greatly desiring to see us. And we, hey, we're greatly desiring to see you. Listen to verse seven and eight. It says, therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and what? Distress. And distress. Christians go through affliction and distress? What? It says, we were comforted concerning you by what? Faith. By your faith. It says, for now we, we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Our second point this morning is a growing faith is a comfort to the suffering. Many of you know what, uh, what this is like. Maybe you're going through a little something, something, but then you hear about what God has done in someone else's life. You're going, man, Lord, you are so great. Have you ever heard uh, somebody give their testimony and you hear about the greatness of God and your, your life could be falling apart, but you hear about the greatness of God and you're going, man, how good. I've never heard a testimony of somebody coming to Jesus and going, that's it? <laughs> that, 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 that's all? No, we, we, we hear about just Jesus coming in and, and, and saving and delivering and transforming. And it, it does something in, in, inside of us. And maybe some of you have, uh, some of your kids are away from the Lord, but as, as, as they're trickling back in to follow Jesus, we could be going through all kinds of stuff and we hear, oh, oh. has your kid ever asked you for a scripture verse? Anybody? Is it? All right, couple. You're like, wait a minute. Why do you want to know? They're like, well, you know, I've just been, been praying. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, I've been praying and I've been, I've been reading my Bible and, hey, I have a question. I'm like, ask away. <laughs> Life could be difficult, but, but just hearing their, their hunger and thirst for the word of God now, you're like, Psh, my world is fine. My world is okay. Paul is letting the church know in his affliction and distress, he was comforted because he heard of their faith. He says, for now we live if you stand fast. Uh, it, it is, is uh, written that, uh, uh, said that Paul wrote uh, this letter from Corinth where he was having a difficult time. But you see, it wasn't all about him and his difficult time. That he's going through something. He didn't say, well, since I'm going through something, everybody's going through it with me. No, he says, I've got my things going on. Let me see how my brethren are doing in Thessalonica. Let me check in on, on them. Because what tends to happen, family, is when suffering hits you and I, it's all about us. No one else matters. But we just don't see that in Scripture. As Paul is going through a difficult time, other people matter. Hmm. That we should turn our attentions from self to others. This is a wonderful thing, but the world says, well, what about you? You make sure you're taken care of. No, 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 no. Biblically, the Lord takes care of us, right? 
And we see here, Paul is saying, I am comforted concerning you by your faith. It says, for now we live if you, if you stand fast in the Lord. Now, let me give you 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, it says, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So he says, you need to be steadfast. You guys remember playing King of the Hill when you were, when you were younger? For some of you, it was a little, a little long time ago, right? <laughs> so if you've never played King of the Hill, so, so you, you pretty much, you dig in and you're just trying to push someone off. The Bible is telling us that we need to dig our feet in. We need to get into a stance because our enemy is going like this. Pushing and pushing and pushing. And if our faith is not anchored in Jesus... We're just going to be sliding and sliding and sliding back. So we are encouraged to be, to be immovable, always abounding in the, the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not, is not in vain. So reading through this book, we see love, joy, faith. But we're also hearing about some tribulations. We're hearing about some afflictions, some sufferings. But Paul is rejoicing that the church is standing fast. Can you imagine uh, Timothy coming back and saying, Paul, they're good. These, these afflictions, what they're going through, their persecutions, it hasn't caused them to, to stop moving forward in Jesus. Well, he goes on in verse 9 and 10. He says, For what thanks can we render to God for you? For all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Our third point this morning is, remember there is more room for growth. Remember there's more room for growth. What if somebody walked up to you and said, hey, how long have you been following Jesus? And you would say, you know, hey, 45 years. And your response was, you've got more room to grow. Would you be offended? Some of you would. Some of you would say, Psh. Read my Bible through once a year. You're telling me I've got more room to grow. I, I invented children's ministry. We're serving all the time and can finish all the words that any pastor says. I know everything. Mm-hmm. 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 Now, what's interesting, family, is uh, Paul says he wants to perfect what is lacking in their faith. In chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Your faith is being spoken of throughout all Asia and Macedonia. Uh, verse, uh, chapter one, verse seven, your faith is being spoke of. Chapter two, verse 13. Chapter two, verses 19 and 20. He's bragging on how great their faith is. But then here he says, we want to meet with you that we might perfect what is lacking in your faith. Well, wait a minute, Paul, you just said we're awesome. Now you're saying we're, we're lacking? Why isn't, an, why isn't it or why wouldn't it be an exciting thing for somebody to say, you've not arrived. You still have a lot of growing to do. Why wouldn't, that, why wouldn't our response be, ooh, more of Jesus. But instead we take it as, ooh, I must be doing something wrong. Maybe it's not about you. That's why we get so offended so easy. We live in a culture where everyone's offended. I'm like, oh my goodness, right? Stay in the text, Henry. Stay in the text. Stay there. <laughs> There's, he, Paul tells the church, although your faith is being spoke of everywhere, there's more room for you to grow. And some of you would be completely offended if I said, hey, good to see you. Thanks for coming to church. You're not there yet. You need to grow some more. You would go <laughs> with the church today and you can't believe what that pastor said. I, I need to grow more in my faith. <laughs> You're laughing because that's exactly what would probably go down. <laughs> I may not come back next Sunday. God bless you. All right? All right? What a wonderful compliment. I can still grow. And not only can you and I still grow, Jesus has more things for you and I. 
He wants to continue to pour into us. So the church didn't say, well, wait a minute. Paul said in chapter one, we were great. Now he's saying we're, we're, our faith is lacking. What? Does he not know who we are? We're the church in Thessalonica. Everybody has heard about our faith. No, Paul is saying, hey, when I come to you, I want to give you what you're lacking, what your faith is lacking. That means I want to give you more Jesus. I want to pour more Jesus into you. And that means, what did John the Baptist say? That Jesus must increase and I must what? Decrease. I must decrease. Hey, John, Jesus is on the scene and all your disciples are going after him. John didn't say, oh no. Oh no, I'm losing my crowd. What are we going to do now? Here's the Lamb of God. John said, no, no, no. Hey, calm down, everybody. I must, I must keep decreasing and Jesus must keep increasing. In all of our lives, family, this is the same truth. We must continue to decrease and Jesus increase. And we all need to grow a whole bunch. And this is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Not only do we, thank you for that one person. Uh, and not only do we all need to grow in our faith, but, 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 but listen, to, listen to his prayer. He says that in verse 10, it says, night and day, praying exceedingly that we, that we may see your face. In verse 9, he says, for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before God. Normally, the prayer goes like this. Father, I need in Jesus' name. Right, 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 right. Paul's prayer is, what joy we have. What thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before God. Pray and night. What was our, our, our prayers? Lord, the people in my row, they bring me such joy. Their Bibles are open. They're learning and they're growing. Lord, keep, keep doing it. Keep blessing them and keep growing them. My point is this, Paul's prayer was for others. They, they, weren't, they, weren't, they weren't about him. And of course, there's nothing wrong with praying for ourselves. But I want to encourage you, the next, time, next opportunity you have to pray, pray for somebody else first. Lord, bless my row, the people in my row. They're, they're here, they're growing, they're learning. Lord, I get so much joy seeing and hearing. Lord, you're doing something in their life. Lord, keep doing it. And then we can roll into, Lord, my need is this. And, and, and he already, he already knows, knows these things. But it says, night and day praying that he might see their face. Family, what if church is to be like this? What if, what if our love for one another is to be like this? That when, when, when somebody in your row is not there, you're going, hey, you want vacation? And sometimes it's yes, and other times it might be, you know, I'm just going through a little something, something. So as they were going through a little something, something, instead of staying plugged in, they said. And then you know how the enemy does? You're gone for a couple Sundays and no one calls. Enemy says, well, that church was so loving. They have it all on the back wall. No one's called you. Then you say, that's right, nobody's called me. I want to encourage you to this. If no one calls you, you call them. You say, hey, I've been gone for three weeks. I've not heard from you, so how are you doing? If you're not going to ask how I'm doing, I'm going to ask how you're doing. Because the flip side is, ooh, no one cares. No one's calling. No one's stopping by. No one's this. Why? Because the enemy's coming for your faith. And he'll use discouragement to do that. But here in our text, so, so beautiful Paul is praying that he wants to, he wants to see their, their face again. How beautiful is that? That, that, that the, the church is, is all of us concerned about one another's faith in Jesus. Praying, it says, praying exceedingly. So maybe next Sunday after we greet each other, Lord willing, and we say good morning, we can say, hey, how's your faith? How's your faith? And just maybe some of you are going to be honest and say, you know what, I'm, you know, it's, it's been a tough go. I'm, 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 I'm struggling in my faith. Has anybody ever been there? Yeah. Uh, like six of us? Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, sometimes just where, where life gets so hard and you're like, Lord, I, I don't know what you're doing. I, 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 I know your word, but I just, I just don't know what you do. I feel so disillusioned. But when you and I come together, when we, when we do life together, let me encourage your faith and you encourage mine. Because none of us have a cape. Amen. None of us are walking on water ever, right? But we can encourage one another in this thing called faith. This is the, this is the pattern that we see here in the text. There's concern, there's trials, there's testings, there's sufferings. Paul is not only praying, he's sending Timothy and then he's, he's praying that he might see them again, that he might give them more of Jesus. Why? Because that's exactly what they need. That's what they need and that's what you and I need. So much so, Paul says this in verse 11. It says, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. It's like, God, we want to see them again. Uh, open up an opportunity for us to, to be with the church at Thessalonica that we might tell them more about you. Listen, he says in verse 12, it says, and may the Lord make you, what? Increase and abound in what? In love to who? One another and to all. Push pause. Whoo, so he's saying that our love would increase and abound. I love that word abound. That means it's spilling over. That means there's more, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's an overabundance. So all we're love. What do you say? That our love, that the Lord would make you increase and abound in love. Now, immediately you're going, well, pastor man, you, you don't know where I've been. You, you don't know what, um, what have I, I've experienced. You don't know my hurts and my pains. Uh, no, I don't. But I can tell you this. The Lord will never say, hey, verse 12 doesn't apply to you. Just skip over verse 12 to verse 13 because I understand what you've gone through. Not in a million years. The operative word here is, and may who? The Lord. May the Lord make you increase and abound. So it sounds a lot like the Lord has to do that. And what a beautiful thing to say, Lord, you know the condition of this. And you're asking me to give it away freely and abundance that it must increase, not only increase, but also abound. Lord, you know who I'm married to, right? <laughs> and you're using the word increase and abound. Lord, you know what? I'll make a deal with you, Lord. When they act right, according to my standards, we may not get to the abound and increase, but we'll, we'll turn it up a little bit. Jesus, help us, right? That that we would follow scripture based upon what we think. So the Lord says, I want your love to, to abound and increase. My prayer would be, Lord, yeah, you're going to have to do that. <laughs> because our love says, well, when you act right, do right, and treat me right, then I'll be obedient to scripture. That's not Bible. Can you imagine Jesus doing that with us? Walk with me for a second. As long as you guys no longer sin, I'll bless you. I'll give you whatever you want. We're like, well, that sounds great, but I'm already done. <laughs> it's like the Lord saying, if you, if you ask for me to deliver you for that, from that, that same thing, one more time, Henry, we're all done. No, but we know that Jesus and his love for us is abounding. It is, it is just crazy out of bounds. A couple of stories that are so beautiful. Uh, there's a woman that was caught in the very act of adultery. So she was guilty of all guilt. I mean, she, dang, she was guilty, right? They, they throw her before Jesus and they say, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Well, Moses said we should stone her. Jesus could have said, do it. She is guilty. You know what Jesus said? He said, you know, he who is without sin cast the first stone. Come again, Jesus. <laughs> okay, he who was without sin, you cast the first stone. The Bible said they dropped their rocks. 
Was it from the oldest to the youngest? That this love of Jesus, even in our guilt, abounds. Because you know how religious you and I are sometimes. Psh. <laughs> she guilty. Is there any other available rocks for me? <laughs> She's guilty. You know how we, we are in our self-righteousness, right? Yeah. Like four of us? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, she, she guilty. Let, let's, let's get it on. But then when it comes to us, Lord, mercy, mercy. When our sin is on somebody else, kill them. Well, when it comes to us, Lord, And you know, when it's real bad, we get all the way down. And sometimes we're like, anybody ever been there? <laughs> You're down low. Lord, we're down low and we need you to, to, to lift us up. Yes. Glory to God that the love of Jesus yes. lifts, yes. lifts us up. He says, our love should be the same for others. We should be in the lifting business, not in the... Oh, you've fallen. <laughs> God bless you. You're laughing because that's what happens a lot with us followers of Jesus. So the Lord is, uh, Paul is saying, the Lord is talking through Paul that, that our love should abound and increase to, to one another. And family, I want to encourage you Jesus, we need your help in this endeavor. Uh, that to, to love as you are asking me to love is beyond, currently beyond my capabilities, but with you, all things are possible. So maybe you're a little gun shot on this thing called love. You got to step out there again because your Lord has asked you to. The Lord actually commands us to, to, do, to do this. And it says, so may, uh, so may the Lord make you increase and abound in love towards one another and to all. Listen to what Paul says, just as we do to you. So our last point uh, this morning is follow biblical examples to loving others. Follow biblical examples to loving others. You might say, well, pastor man, hey, I didn't grow up in a, you know, my mom and dad, you know, maybe grandma raised me and they had a, a rough go. So I just don't know how to do this thing called love. Well, we have an example here in the scriptures of how we are to love. And not only that, let me, let me give this one. John 13, 34. It says, a new commandment I give you. This is Jesus speaking. It says that you love one another as I have loved you. Hmm. So if you're a follower of Jesus, the Lord has loved upon you. We are to in turn love the same way. So if Jesus pours a torrent of love on us, we shouldn't give sprinkles of love towards others. The same way that Jesus has loved us, we are told to love others the very same way. You know, we like Jesus, woo-hoo. We need your help to do that. Because wow, wow. Jesus, uh, uh, help us. And he says, just as we do to you. So Paul's letting them know, Love each other the way we're loving you. We're sending Timothy to check on you. We're, 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 we're praying exceedingly to see your face. We want to give you the gospel of Jesus. We want to continue to pour Jesus into you. Do that with everyone. Now do that with the, with the entire church. And he says in verse 13, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with, with all of his saints. So, letting them know, hey, Jesus is coming back for his church. We're going to read about the rapture or the, it's called the harpazo in a couple of chapters. That knowing that Jesus is coming back, it should change the way we live, uh, change the way we love, change the way we serve because we, we want to be ready. We, want, we don't want Jesus to come back and we go, oh, can you give me a couple more years? <laughs> you, many of you will understand. I uh, remember old school several years ago when, for a lot of years ago, when you came home from school, uh, your parent or a parent said, hey, change from your school clothes and put on your what? Put on your play clothes. 
So they're letting us know when, when you get home, there's uh, some things that need to, need to happen. And my mom uh, was working, so we knew that she would be home around, you know, 5, 5.30. So she gave us uh, some commands to do. Change your clothes, fix the kitchen, don't break anything, yada, yada, yada. So we came home. We didn't change our school clothes. We didn't clean the kitchen. So we were messing around, and we heard a, Ching, ding, 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 ding. What was that? Did you hear that? She's early. We're like, uh oh. We heard that door open. Mom walked in, and we had a come to Jesus meeting, and we didn't know Jesus back then. She came at a time we were not prepared. If we knew she was going to be early, we would have done a better job. <laughs> Why are you in your school clothes? Huh? <laughs> you heard me. Why? Why are you still wearing what you should have taken off hours ago? <laughs> well, mom, you see what had happened was <laughs> family Jesus is coming back for his church. We must live holy lives. Uh, the world says, hey, live like this, believe like this. It's like we need, to, we need to like wash every day from the world because the world is telling you it's about you. The world says you're awesome. The world says, what can we do for you? Burger King, have it your way. <laughs> <laughs> you go to Subway, they'll custom make a sandwich for you, you know, and if it's, if it's not right, you say, I wanted the mayonnaise on top of of the lettuce. <laughs> As Jesus is preparing a place for us, one day he will come again for us. And what's he going to find, family? If, what's, 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 I can't read the clock, but it's 10, 1048. What if Jesus came right now? Would, would, would there be some regret? Would you be like, oh, he's going to see you that. I mean, Jesus is calling you and I to live a life of holiness. And this doesn't mean going into a cave in Idlewild or a cave in San Bernardino and, you know, living, you know, without anything. No, this means follow Jesus and make sure that the world doesn't grab you because Jesus is our, our holiness, amen? That you and I in ourselves, I mean, we, we need somebody to, to wash us. So we want to stay as close to Jesus as possible because one day we're going to see Jesus and we want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And we want him to say, hey, you stayed at the plow. Amen. The world didn't, didn't, uh, didn't come for your faith or the world uh, was, uh, uh, was unsuccessful at coming for your faith and you lived a life uh, that was pleasing to me. That's, that's, Jesus, help, help us to do that. Jesus, help me to, to live a life that, that, that glorifies you. Because we need his help. As the, the society we live in today, I mean, uh, everything is just thrown out at us. And then if we don't agree with that, somehow we're the ones that are wrong. Right. Somehow, somehow we're the ones that, that, are, that, that, that don't fit. I mean, what, what do you mean? So let's, let's follow Jesus. Let's follow, uh, let's follow his, his mandates that, that he's given here, that we would cultivate our faith, that we would uh, uh, seek to love, that we would take the same type of love that Jesus has given us and that we, would, that we would love one another. Let me give you one scripture and then a couple things to take home with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. It says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, it says, cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Jesus, cleanse us. Jesus, walk with us, guide us and direct us. And when and if we stumble in some mud, Jesus, come and wash us by your Holy Spirit. Come and wash. What did David say? Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Well, let me give you four things to take home with you. Uh, the first one is, uh, what would Jesus say is lacking in your faith today? What would Jesus say? If you, you and Jesus were to sit down and he, what would he point to in your life to say, this is what you, your faith is lacking? And secondly, in which ways can your love increase for others? And the follow-up question will be, are you willing to do it? 
It's one thing to know how it can increase. It's another thing. Are you willing to do it? Uh, thirdly, uh, knowing we will meet Jesus one day, how does this affect your daily life? We just talked about that. And then lastly, how are you cultivating your faith and love? How are you, how are you cultivating it? I'm excited for you, those of you that will come to the equip class, because what we're going to do is we're going we're to cultivate the word of God in our lives. We're going to dig deep into it. And then we're going to read it, pick it apart. And then we're going to do what it says. It's important that we cultivate God's word in our lives. That's how we, that's how we learn and that's how we grow. There's no shortcuts to, to growth. There's no shortcuts to being close with Jesus. We just have to read his word and do what it says. Your faith matters. Your faith matters. Jesus, we love you because you first loved us. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters that are here and, and online. Help us to take up the shield of faith. Help us to guard our faith, to cultivate it. And then, Lord, when it comes to this thing called love, we, we receive your love for us in its abundance. We, we yearn for it. We, we swim in it. We desire it. But when it comes to showing that same love to others, we, we sometimes act like it's ours. We sometimes act like love belongs to us. Jesus, we, we want to be your, your conduit of love towards others. We want to tell them the truth in love. We want to tell them about your grace in love. Just maybe you have planted people in our lives that are simply waiting for us to show them your love. But yet we've been a little stingy. So Jesus, our prayer is that we would be all that you desire us to be. We've read your word. We want to be doers of your word, but we need your help to love abundantly for our love to increase. Oh, Jesus, we need you. But you are more than able and you're more than willing because that's what you want. That's what your word says. So here we are, your people. Continue to fill us up. Continue to, to draw us closer and closer to you, Jesus, because we all have more room to grow. So, Lord, we're excited about that. Lord, keep plowing our fields. Keep pruning us, Jesus, that we might bear more and more fruit. Oh, Jesus, I know you want to do great things in all of us. Help us to no longer fight you. Help us to simply read your word and follow what it says. You will empower us. So do a, a, do a great work. Lord, you know what I'm trying to say. So be magnified in all of us. We're so excited to, 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 to walk this text out that we would, our love would overflow. It would just abound to others, even to those whom we would deem are undeserving because Jesus, you didn't deem us undeserving, but you went to a cross for us to set us free, to give us hope, and if you're here today, friend, I want to talk to you for a couple, a couple seconds about hope, about faith, and about love. You might be alive, but the Bible says that uh, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. Jesus has a plan for your life, and it will exceed the level of hope you're currently living. I want to tell you Jesus is real. He loves you. He's got a plan for you. He's preparing a place for you. He has all the power to transform your life and to give you hope. You just have to say yes. You just have to believe and you have to trust. If you can get on an airplane with a complete stranger flying you 30,000 feet in the air and take a nap for three hours, you can believe that Jesus loves you. You can believe that Jesus loves you. The enemy would say, oh, this is a fairy tale. Look at your life, friend. Where's your hope? 
Is it in your 401k? Is it in your bank account? Is it in your health? Is it in your relationships? All of those things are sinking sand. All of those things are, are, are in transit. They're in flux. They're temporal. But Jesus is eternal. I want to lead you in a simple prayer that just calls out to Jesus to save. And the Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So no matter who you are, where you've been, how long you've been on that path, if you repent of your sins and say yes to Jesus, I guarantee you everything is going to change in your life because that's what the Bible says. If any man, any woman be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. So let's you and I pray together if that is what the Spirit of God is drawing you to do right now. Father in heaven, forgive me a sinner. Jesus, I repent of my sins now and I turn to you and believe your gospel, your good news. Make me a new creation. Take my life, take the ashes of my life and make them beautiful. Jesus, I lay everything down at your feet. I'm calling out for you to save me. And I ask these things in your name, Jesus. And if you said that prayer and you're, you're online and Jesus is now your Lord and Savior, there's a link that you'll see. Click that. It's a small little video just encouraging you and to read your Bible and to pray and uh, go to a Bible-believing church somewhere. And if you're in here, let somebody in your room know, hey, I just gave my life to Jesus. Can you encourage me? Can you, can you just say a, a prayer for me? And, and, and we will definitely do that. But let somebody know what's happened to you. Thank you, Jesus, for being so good, for your grace and your mercy is abundant. We ask these things in Jesus' name. The church said amen, amen and amen.